have your sermon section and your Bibles. I'm going to continue uh, looking at some of the carols, some of the classic carols. Two weeks ago, we looked at Oh Holy Night. We took some phrases from that beautiful Christmas song, and uh, we were able to share some of the truths that God's Word tells us regarding that song. And today, I'm going to take this the little carol, Away to Manger, that we sing and we have hear it every year, probably since the day we were born, since it was written back in 1885, and as that Away to Manger was written, the mystery around that song is this, uh, who wrote it? And some thought, since it was published in an 1885 Lutheran Sunday School curriculum, they thought possibly it was Martin Luther, uh, the great Martin Luther of the Reformation. But um, they're not certain, and probably is true that it was not him that wrote the song. But the mystery around the song has always been, uh, after he wrote it, has always been true. But there is no mystery to the fact that he has touched hundreds and thousands of lives throughout every Christmas season. And this morning we're going to listen to the Away to Manger Christmas Carol at this time. One of your favorites, uh, and you were wanting us to do that this year. Uh, we did it just for you, okay? As we as we look at the words of that song, and again, we've all we've sung it many, many times. Um, I'm going to pull out. I'm going to pull out a phrase of that song here uh, that is in there several, several times. And the phrase is, little Lord Jesus. The phrase is, little Lord Jesus. And when we think of that, that those words or that phrase, the phrase, Lord Jesus, throughout the New Testament, is penned 740 times the phrase, or the words, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, referring to him as Lord. In Luke's Gospel, we see that the shepherds were watching their flock by night, and the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and in Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, it says this, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy, that will be for all the people, verse 11, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. And he is Christ the Lord. And he is Christ the Lord. That's just one of those times out of 740 that we see those words. So what does it mean? What does it mean when we say Christ the Lord or Jesus is Lord? What does it mean? What does it mean when we use the word Lord? Well, in the Greek, there's a word that is used for this word that is karyos, K-U-R-I-O-S, karyos, and here's what that word means, Lord. Supreme in authority, controller, or Lord. Supreme in authority, controller, or it means Lord. Now when we think of those three definitions, maybe the word controller is the one that kind of sticks out with you because... You might be a controlling person. There's a few of them around. I don't know how many. I don't count them. I don't have the exact number. But I'm sure in this room, there are people in this room, your personality is a controlling type personality. How many know somebody else that is controlling, right? And you know them, and you would identify them being controlling more than you would identify yourself as being controlling, and vice versa, all right? 
them with you versus you with them. So when we think of this word controller, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is supreme. He's controller. He is Lord. Carry us. That's what this little song says. The little Lord Jesus. And it says it several, several times. So what does it mean? What does it mean for him to be in control? You know, we, we say, well, there's some things that I know I'm in control with. At my house, I'm in control of the money, right? And normally, every household has one person that is more inclined to treat money better than the other person. Is that true? Or am I talking to people that are from another planet? Huh? Okay. And so, you know, and maybe even you would be the one that would admit it. You know, you know I'm, I, I, let, let, let her do the money. You know, that's fine with me. You know, and you get your allowance every week. <coughs> oh, I, it's not funny. I know guys that get their allowances every week, and I think it's not funny. <laughs> oh, dear. And they even have to ask for it because the person that's in control of the money almost forgets that they're supposed to give them an allowance. It's pretty hilarious, isn't it, huh? Some of you right now, you're not making any expression at all because you know that's who you are. This is, you want to see what I see. This is hilarious. You all are hilarious this morning. I never thought this message was going to go this way. I haven't even got to the heart of it yet. Today's message was supposed to be more of a, of a kind of a direct, kind of in-your-face type of a message. And, and, and next week, we're going to be a little bit more the heartfelt, encouraging so maybe it's good that you're laughing before we go into your face direct type message with this whole thing. But as we look at this word, karyos, he is supreme authority, he's controller, he is Lord, okay? He is Lord. And uh, again, enough of that. So when Jesus, when Jesus is, 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 is Lord of our life, when he's Lord of our life, when we say, Lord Jesus... And we call him our Lord. We are saying, according to the definition, we are saying he is controller, he's, he's supreme in my life, and he is Lord. Now when we use the word, um, make Jesus Lord, just technically, we don't make him Lord, okay? He's already Lord. <laughs> he is already Lord, okay? When, I know what we mean. We mean that we're going to surrender to his Lordship. Okay, you know, we can't make him Lord. You know, he is already that. But when we surrender to his Lordship, that's when he is Lord of our lives. And, and I think it's, re, it's a matter of us relinquishing the control and letting him be that controller. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about surrendering to the Lordship of Christ. And there's basically two levels of surrender that I'm going to talk about today. And uh, don't... Um, don't judge me on this theologically. I'm just going to make these two points to, to make my point regarding the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The first one is the partially surrendered life. I'm going to talk to you first of all about the partially surrendered life. And I'm going to talk about that because it's huge. It's huge. Where we live. It's, it's, it's been a part of my walk with God. And it's maybe have been a part of your walk with God, the, the partially surrendered life. And I think that we live in a culture where there's so many things pulling at us from so many different directions and that we just say, well, you know what, I'm going to do A, B, and C over here with the Lord thing, but I'm still going to have this part over here that I'm still going to kind of be in control of. And so we call that the partially surrendered life. And it's really interesting because we have, we have a verse of scripture that Jesus, here he is, he's talking to the wise builder and the foolish builder, okay? The wise and the foolish. We all know the wise and we know the foolish. And here is Jesus, he's talking to them and he says to the foolish builder, here's what he says in our, our scripture here in Luke chapter 6, verse 46. He said, why do you call me Lord? Lord, he said it twice. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do 
what I say. In other words, not that Jesus has to scratch his head, but he was getting a point across, and I loved his approach. He would use a side door approach that would just blow people out of the water because it, they didn't like it because he got it every <coughs> single time. So he said, oh, by the way, he says, why are you calling me Lord, Lord, and you don't even do what I say? So, so, you know, he could be scratching his head and say, does that confuse you, or should I be confused that you would do that? That would be something that I would say, right? You know, um, put it back on the person and say, what do you think about that? Does that make any sense? And I'm saying this, to the partially surrendered life of people in our world today, <clears throat> would Jesus be saying that? Would he be saying, why, why are you calling me Lord, Lord, and, and you're not even doing it, you're not even doing what I say. You know, we believe in God, but, but you know, we're not going to trust him with everything. You know, we, we believe in God, but, but, but you know what, we still want, want what we want. We believe in God, but, but you know, we still want this partial control. And it would be like me taking the Bible this morning and opening up the Bible and literally just saying, okay, the part about forgiveness, ah, I don't want that. Just rip that out of the Bible and throw it away. Or the part about, um, you know, putting others before myself, ah, I don't like that. And rip that out of the Bible and, and throw that away. Or the part about, you know, how we should, should, should we pay our tithe to give to the Lord and we should be a not forsake the sin of ourselves together. And, and we're going to rip that out because that just doesn't quite fit what we're saying and what we believe. The partially surrendered life is really a life that has to be miserable. And there's something about, there's something about the partial surrendered life. There's, there, there's no real joy. There's no real joy because there's always that tug of war that's going on inside. The partially surrendered life is, is, is that life, you know, where, where if, somebody, if somebody really, really hurts you, you're going to choose not to forgive them. Not because the Bible says that you shouldn't forgive them, but just simply because you want control of that part of your life. You know what? Every single one of us, we're guilty about those things that we want control of. Right? Some of you, it's the remote control. <laughs> right? Some of you, you will not ride with anybody else. You're going to do all the driving. Because you don't want anybody else to drive because you're the best. And while you're driving, they're scared to death. Right? So here we are, you know, this whole part of us being in control, you know, it just is it's huge. But that partially surrendered life is a life that really there's a war going on inside. So I have the uh, translation, I have a, 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 a translation for you of Proverbs chapter 3. It's called the partially surrendered version, okay? The partially surrendered version. And here's what it says. Trust in the Lord with some of your heart. Lean not on, lean on your own understanding. Only in some, and then in some of your ways, in some of your ways acknowledge Him. And you can make your own paths straight. Alright? So there we have the partially surrendered version. And for some of you that might be new here today, there's no such thing. Okay? You know... When Heather tried to look that up in the computer, there was no place on the computer that that would bring up for her, although it would bring up any other translation that she put in there, obviously. So this was not one. But Jesus is no part-time Lord. Okay? He's no part-time Lord. He wants to be Lord. So the question that we have today is this. The question for you is this. What one area or what one thing in your life that you know right now you do not have surrendered <coughs> to the Lord? Just one. Maybe it's two. Maybe it's three. Okay? We don't use the application for this. We'll continue to be that person who is just partially surrendered to the Lord. What is it? Is it your children? Is it your children that you just you just can't you just can't surrender them to the Lord because you are wanting to be so controlling of everything that they're doing, even when they are beyond 
the years of being in your house? You see, well, Pat, I love them, and, and I, I, I'm this scared, and I'm afraid something's going to happen, and I, I want to protect them, and it's just part of my nature, it's part of my parents, me being a parent. My question is this, can you trust the Lord with your kids? Can you trust the Lord with your health? That's probably the one that I have probably struggled with for myself all through the years. I guess when I was younger, I was always afraid uh, that I would die of kidney failure. For some reason, that was on my mind when I was in my 20s and 30s. I have no idea. There's no way of even knowing where that came from. It wasn't until I watched a movie or, or had a bad dream or, or whatever. But for some reason, for some reason, years ago, up into even my middle age adult, I, I thought, of all things, I'm probably going to die of kidney failure. Okay? Now, if I would convince myself of that long enough, I could maybe convince God that that's what I'm going to die of. And maybe he would help me die that way. But my point is this. I came to a point in my life, in my life, where, you know what? First of all, I'm thankful for my health. And all of us need to be thankful for our health. Every single day that we have health. Okay, even though you might take a pill or two, or you might have a pain here and there, I think we all need to be thankful for our health. Amen? Oh, yeah. well, I know that would be a big amen. So you know what? I really, really don't, I'm not afraid now, I'm not afraid of dying of kidney failure. Because I have trusted God with my life and with my health. Okay? I believe I've done that. And so I'm confessing that and admitting that before you. Is it maybe your temper? Maybe you just have a horrible, horrible temper, and maybe it's just something that is totally out of control, and you know very well it needs to be surrendered, and it needs to be given to God. Maybe it's a relationship. It could be maybe your finances. Maybe it's your future. What is it? What is that one thing? Or what are those things that maybe you have not yet surrendered to Jesus Christ? Okay? A lukewarm, half-hearted, partial surrender is not what God wants, okay? Jesus is no part-time Lord. He doesn't want us to be part-time followers. So I go to my second point before we close out today, and we're going to talk about the fully surrendered life. The partially surrendered life, and then we have a picture of the fully <coughs> surrendered life. There's nothing to be held back on with this life. So I have a scripture for you in Romans chapter 14. It's a powerful, powerful scripture. We're going to take our time and just read it slowly this morning. And this scripture right here is, is the heart of this point. And I'm going to move on from here. For we don't live for ourselves. This is Paul. He's talking to the believers. He said this. He said, for we don't live for ourselves and we don't die for ourselves. Hang on. Okay. Verse 8. If we live, how many are living? Six. That's amazing. <laughs> oh. Bow our heads. Would you please come to the altar? Repent. We're not living. All right. For if we live, or if we die, is to honor the Lord, the controller, the supreme person, the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, Paul said this, we belong to the controller, the Lord. That's amazing. I don't think, I don't think, I don't think very many of us are living that way. I, I don't, I don't think we've grabbed a hold of that the way that God wants us to. So in talking about this fully surrendered life, I just feel like this verse is the key verse for us living that fully surrendered life. And I'll pause and say this. I believe, I believe with all of my heart, there can be a process, a process to that fully surrendered life. Just like 
there was a process for me thinking about my health and me having uh, kidney failure when I was young. And there was a point in my life I quit, I quit thinking that. I quit, I quit acting that way. And I quit even, even talking about it, okay? What did you remind me about it this morning for? I don't know. But here we are. The fully surrendered life. The fully surrendered life. Is a, is a life that I think we can come to a point where we say, okay, I am there. I am there. Um, let me give you the real translation now to, <laughs> to uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 6, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. The word acknowledge was not really a good translation from, from, from the... Uh, from the, the, uh, the Hebrew to, to, the, uh, to the English. But the word yada, the word yada for that word in the original means to know. So I think to know him versus just acknowledging him would be a truer, a much truer translation to that word. Now there's reasons why we don't trust him. And you know that. You can list the names of the reasons why you don't trust him. But you know what? If we don't truly trust him, it's probably because, and I want you to get this, okay? If we're not truly, wholly trusting him, I think it could be because we don't truly, really know him. In relationships, you that are married, you that are in, in meaningful relationships, the trust in that relationship is because you know them. You know them, and when you know them, you trust them. Right? You trust them. And somebody else could say something that would be, be off the wall, that would be awful, 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 and you would say, no. No, that is not true, because I know them. You know what? Now, in the flesh, we can mess up, but God's not going to mess up. I think the reason this morning why there are people that are not completely, fully trusting in Him, and they're not completely, fully surrendered to Him, think about it. I think one of the main reasons would be because they don't really, truly, really know him. The scripture said that I, that, that I may know him and the power is resurrection. Yeah. That I may know him. And you know what? When we want a good, lasting, trusting relationship, we will do all that we can to know all that we can know about the person in that relationship. And let me say this, if you've just been a partially surrendered person, I think the difference, and the difference maker will be this, when you really, truly, truly know him, you can trust him. You can trust him. Amen. We're going to close out with a song this morning. And this song talks about being surrendered to Him. And before we sing this song, before I even do a prayer, there's a scripture in Matthew that says this, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter in. Just because you say that doesn't mean you're going to enter in. But here's the good news. Don't you like good news? I like good news better than bad news. Anyway, don't you? Now come on, some people like bad news, but I, I like good news. Come on, that's right. Please clap. Let's clap. Right. We like good news. Right? There you go. Thank you.
told you back in Dallas years ago, they, Paul Harvey told the story about they, this newspaper. They ran all the good news, all the good news in this newspaper. And it about went bankrupt. People don't want to hear good news. In Dallas, but in Plymouth we do, right? Not everyone that says me, Lord, Lord, will enter in. But the good news. But he who does the will of my Father. I'm done. Not everyone's going to enter in that says, Lord, Lord. But who's going to enter in? Those that do the will of the Father. Those that are not partially surrendered, but those that are fully surrendered. And when are we fully surrendered? We are fully surrendered when we know Him. Because when we really, really know Him, we're going to trust Him.